welcome back to iGen Politics. This is a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. This is Victor Xi. I'm currently a sophomore at UCLA, was elected as the youngest delegate for Joe Biden, and also co-hosts this podcast. And I'm Jill Wine-Banks, and welcome back not just to iGen Politics, but welcome to 2022. This is our first recording of the year. Um, I'm the author of The Watergate Girl and the wearer of hashtag Jill's Pins. And today, in honor of our special guest who is a writer, I'm wearing a pen as my pin. And I got to say that correctly. <laughs> <laughs> like Jill said, it's 2022, which means that this year, the Biden administration must achieve its goals before the midterm elections. That means passing voting rights and components of the Build Back Better and defeating the pandemic before the midterm elections swing into full gear. On top of that, this year is critical for the future of our democracy. How do we protect it? Where and how much accountability is needed? Our guest today is Molly Jong Fast. And she is here to talk to us about all of those things. Um, As we begin the new year and look ahead to what's coming, Molly is the editor-at-large of The Daily Beast. She is also a regular contributor to Vogue and the host of the Abnormal podcast. Most recently, Molly became a weekly columnist at The Atlantic, producing a column called Wait What? Thank you so much for being here with us today, Molly. Well, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. We are so glad. And we'll talk about the unique events of 2021 and the political landscape of 2022. Um, But before we do so, one of the things that we love doing on this podcast is allowing our audience to get to know better the people they read, hear, or see. Um, For you both, your parents were writers, and I'm wondering how they shaped or influenced what you're doing now. So I actually, my, my... so my grandfather, Howard Fast, was a pretty famous writer, in, and in the 70s, he had a party, and at that party, my mother met my father, and my father was a writer, but, you know, he wrote science fiction, and my grandfather at that time was writing these uh, very successful but pretty mainstream novels about... Uh, these families, sort of dynasty kind of as a book, that were very in style. And he was also writing TV and uh, movies. So, uh, but I didn't grow up in Los Angeles. I grew up in New York. So I would say that what I thought growing up was that being a writer was a really good career where you could support a family. That is completely insane. And so had I grown up in a normal family where my father had been a doctor or my mother had been a lawyer, I think I would have, would be a little more sane and have a little more of a sense of what uh, normal people do and how they make a living. So that has influenced me because I don't know that I would have been a writer had I grown up in a normal family. This is one of those times when the intergenerational aspect of this show comes (laughs) into play because of course I knew and read Howard Fast, and uh, Victor was, well, Victor doesn't, I'm sure. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, thank goodness you are a writer, but I mean, how did you get to where you were, or I guess are today? So I wrote, so I've had like sort of an interesting, I haven't had a completely straight line in my Uh, career. I started out writing novels when I was young, which is a little bit like a lot of times people start out like I wish I had started out working in a newsroom, being like a fact checker and started out in a more traditional in a more traditional background, because I think it would have really helped me learn a lot of stuff that I didn't that I had to learn later, which was harder. Um, but I started out writing novels and then I went to writing nonfiction. I had always written essays, but I hadn't written like more nonfiction reporting. And so I got to that later in my career. Um, I, I don't, it's a very kind of unusual way to do it. Usually it's sort of the opposite. Hmm. Interesting. Um, So let's get into this year and last year. So we're done with 2021. So I guess let's get an overview maybe on your thoughts of 2021 and what you expect to see in 2022. I mean, it's the midterms, right? I'm worried. I want to know what Jill thinks about why Merrick Garland hasn't 
gone after the ringleaders of January 6th, and is he going to now? Sorry. Okay, let me answer that. Okay, well, yeah. I think that hopefully Merrick Garland is conducting an investigation through his staff that because the appropriate way for the Department of Justice to function is in silence and secrecy, not to leak things, that they may be doing a lot of work that we don't know about. To me, there would be no Mm -hmm. excuse, one, for not investigating, and two, based on what is already public, for not indicting for a number of crimes, some of which go back to, for example, the Mueller report and the obstruction of justice. That's pretty obvious, Mm -hmm. some of which are clearly under investigation in New York, which has to do with taxes. I still want to know what happened to the audit. He said he was under audit in 2015. (laughs) It's now 2022. I'm sorry, but audits don't take that long. Why isn't that over? One way or the other. Either he owes $100 million in back taxes or he's free and clear. But I want to know. So I would definitely be pushing Merrick Garland to take small steps. He doesn't have to have the whole case wrapped up in order to announce a single indictment. Do it one step at a time. They don't all have to be in one indictment. So yeah, I know America is getting impatient, but I also want to point out that it takes a long time to do an investigation of this magnitude. And a lot of this happened in public, which makes it in a way easier because we saw it, unlike in Watergate, which seems to have gone faster and was in secret. We had to wait until we found out there were tapes and then get the tapes in order to have a case built. Some of this is in public. I mean, you have a recording of the conversation in Georgia. So yeah, I think, I think it's time. I think we should get going on that. But, but it is interesting. Go, go ahead, on. go ahead. It's interesting to me, uh, I mean, do you, like, the the thing I think about is, like, it's such a different Republican Party than it was during Watergate. It's not just a different Republican Party, it's a different media landscape. And that's an important yeah. element, and one of the reasons that we have you on the show to talk about the media landscape, because during Watergate, there were only three networks, and they all had the same facts. We did not have mm-hmm. alternative facts, we did not have conspiracy theories, Uh, I mean, there were conspiracy theories, but not in the way that we mean today. And so I think that makes a big difference because we weren't fighting about reality. We might debate policy outcomes, but we didn't debate the facts. And that makes a big difference. There were also different standards for things that were allowed on television and weren't. Yeah, right. Yes, we still had a fairness doctrine, (laughs) which we don't have anymore. And so that if, if you presented one point of view, you had to p- present another. And I don't mean what's being proposed now, that if you present the Holocaust in a schoolroom, that you have to present the other <laughs> point of view because there is no other point of view. Right. We stuck to facts. Right. And so I think that is important. But may, let's, let's talk more about the challenges of 2022 oh, yeah, and what you expect to see. And, and also, what are the challenges the Biden administration um, is going to face in 2022 um, and particularly focusing on what I think is the existential threat to our democracy, uh, which you have, of course, written about and, and The Atlantic has written many pieces about or has published many pieces about? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. And I think for sure the the existential threat to our democracy is huge. And it's funny because I think about, I was just writing a piece about Marjorie Taylor Greene, and if you think, and in it, there I talk about how there's, when Trump lost, mm-hmm. he kept saying, I didn't lose, I didn't lose. And there's that quote from the unnamed Republican official who says, what does it matter? I'm going to, can I read the quote? Yes, for a please. Because I feel like it's so emblematic of where we are in, uh, as a country, Right. So, exactly. So he says, okay, so they say, what's the downside of humoring him for a few, wait, what's the downside of humoring him for this little bit of time? No one seriously thinks the results will change. He went golfing this weekend. It's not like he's plotting how to prevent Joe (laughs) Biden from taking power on January 20th. 
<laughs> he's tweeting about filing some lawsuits. Those lawsuits will fail, and then he'll tweet some more about how the election was stolen, and then he'll leave. Wow. And then, the, and I just want to follow that up with the, since then, two thirds of GOP respondents in this and this NPR poll from yesterday say that voter fraud helped Joe Biden win the 2020 election. So if we keep going on this path, that's a year, right? A year from nobody thinks he'll actually, he's just going to play golf to the third, you know, two thirds of the party think that he has uh, been, you know, displaced and that there was voter fraud. They believe the big lie. So uh, my guess is that if we go, if we continue down that path, who knows what the next year will bring, right? We have to have a radical change and we need a Republican party to embrace democracy too. I mean, it cannot be a one party system, right? You can't have one party saying like, we believe in democracy, we believe in democratic norms, and we are, you know, it, it is not, it doesn't work if just one party believes in it. So, and over the last year, we've seen Republicans on the state level consolidate power, you know, galvanize their base, tell their base, you know, I mean, I think a really good example of what's been really worrying is that, is that these state parties, you saw it yesterday too, these state parties will say, uh, will disavow the punishment for the violent crime, but not the violent crime. So you'll have people like Marjorie Taylor Greene or, you know, a lot of these members of Congress who will say, you know, these January 6th uh, participants are not being treated well. But that's not what this is about. (laughs) Disavow the violence. Don't disavow the jailing. And look, there is certainly a case for criminal justice reform. No one here is saying that we should, that our jails are going great. But that's not what this is about. This is really about Republicans need to be partners with Democrats to save American democracy. I don't know that that's going to happen, but I think that's the only way out of this sort of democracy death spiral we're in. Uh, I, uh, you wrote a piece in The Atlantic called Biden Needs an Enemy, and you wrote, now Biden needs to remind Americans of what he is trying to achieve, rescuing democracy from the threat of authoritarianism both at home and abroad, and ask them to enlist alongside him in that cause. And so tell us more about what you think the enemy could be, should be, and how that will help to save democracy. So what I think, if you had a if you had a kind of narrative that was a little more clear, I, I mean, what the ideal would be is if you had Mitch McConnell, I mean, I know this has never happened. This is my fantasy. But if you had Mitch McConnell go, uh, go along with Biden and say, like, the stakes are too high. We have to save American democracy. We cannot. No more of this trying to consolidate power. I mean, this is really a fantasy. This is not going to happen. But and then they say, you know, the the fight should be against authoritarianism, like what's happening with Bolsonaro, like what's happening Orban. in Russia, Orban. You know, the fight is for to continue democracy, right? We're like, you know, 260 plus, you know, almost 260 years, right? We're at that point where Amer- where republics sometimes fail. So I, I think, I mean, I've read there are now two different books out right now about how uh, you know, there's how this this could be the end of it, right? That there could be some kind of secession. And you even see Marjorie Taylor Greene sort of pitching a national divorce. I mean, no, I think that we have to be clear-eyed that any talk of that is really a request for a civil war. And that is really the sort of third rail of American politics, that we don't, you know, we don't talk like that. But But I do see a real danger of that. And I think most people are really worried about that as well. They should be. So I could. So I think the enemy should be that, you know, division, authoritarianism to try to keep democratic norms. I don't uh, I don't know. You know, I don't I think that um, part of the problem with Democrats always is the desire to take the high road and You know, it's not that Republicans don't take the high road. They don't. But it's also that um, the, you know, the way the media is structured right now, we have 
a far right media that is really, really, really good at programming. And there's no counter programming. There's nothing. So it's just Fox and OAN and Newsmax and, you know, MAGA News 123 and all of these other little sites that have no accountability to truth and are pumping, pumping, pumping um, content, which is then being shared on social media. So I think it's very problematic. Uh, And I completely agree with you that it's a question of communication, which the Democrats haven't been great at, and the Republicans have stayed on message, and it is getting repeated much more often, but the Republicans are still a minority, and we, we do need a strategy for Biden and his administration to move us towards saving democracy. You have Trump on the other side. Uh, The reason I mentioned Orban is because he just endorsed Orban. And this is, this is really terrifying. Oh, good. It's not my dog. (laughs) I have like 50 dogs. (laughs) Then I love you even more. That's fabulous. (laughs) I have have three. Okay. I just have one, but he's, he's, he he can be quite, (laughs) he can be quite loud. (laughs) Yes. Um, But anyway, um, do you think Democrats realize the severity of the threat we face and, and maybe do Republicans as well? Because, it may be even more important that Republicans in power recognize this. And what can Democrats do differently to get people to care more about the very fundamentals of democracy, which, of course, voting rights would be one of those things, um, and facts would be another part. But what, what can we be doing? I think that's a really good question. The first thing that needs to happen is that Demo- I, yeah, I mean, yes, I agree. And I hope that there are Republicans who can't, we can get some, re- I mean, one of the things that I think, like, you don't have to like Liz Cheney or Adam Kinzinger, but they have been, they have done something very brave. And while I don't agree with them politically, they, you know, it's two people who did it. <laughs> it's just two people. I mean, it's a very small, I mean, there are people in the Republican Party. I mean, Mitt Romney, too. You know, there have... So I would say uh, we need more of that. We need those people to figure out a voting rights bill with Democrats that is um, really a protection. Like, I mean, look, one of the problems with the... Like, they need to sit down and write a voting rights bill that really is just... Uh, you can't overturn elections. You can't, you know, like state legislators cannot go against the popular vote. They can't not count certain. I mean, we need like the bare minimum spelled out and passed by Congress today because we see and and, uh, you know, we've seen this on the state level. Republican legislators are crazy, right? Like in Texas, they overturned Roe. They just were like, you know, we're just going to do this. So, uh, and the Supreme Court let them do it. So it, we're really in a state right now where um, we need to see, like, the bare minimum written down and done. And Republicans need to support that. I would also say that uh, one of the things that I think the Biden administration is not doing enough of is there are a lot of very good communicators in that administration, like, A great example is Mayor Pete. Mayor Pete should be on Fox News every day. Like, it sucks. It's not fun. Nobody wants to go on Fox News. But, like, the truth is he's very good on Fox News. That Fox News audience isn't going to see any other Democrats. It's not like they're flipping the channels going to CNN. Like, that, you know, Mayor Pete should be on there every day. Mayor Pete... I actually think that, sorry, go on. No, I was just going to agree with you on that. I I think he is a great communicator and it would be painful to do, but he might actually be able to be heard by Fox viewers. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like there's a real media silo problem and it is, um, and the Biden administration needs to break through that. I would say Vice President Harris is a really good communicator and she should be out there. And she should be, you know, she should be talking, should have, I think Biden should give shorter speeches, but give them at night and not during the day. So they are, they end up being in the evening news. I think that the, um, the administration, there are, you know, like, for example, Mitch Landrieu, who just came in, 
is a very, is a kind of speaker who's extremely appealing to the Fox News audience. Mm. His Southern accent, he's like a very, he looks like a Republican, um, but he's really, really smart. And he did a lot of great stuff when he was including, you know, he did, gave the, the thing that ended his career was this, uh, was this Confederate monument speech where he said, we have to pull down these mm-hmm. Confederate monuments. So he's a really good guy and he should be out there. I mean, there are people in this administration who should be out there every day. And I think the, you know, Democrats always feel that they're sort of too good to sell. But the truth is, if they're not selling, yeah. no one's buying. Yeah. Exactly. So, but it, it, sort of what you're talking about requires passing legislation. And in order to do that, um, as President Biden recognized recently in an ABC interview when he said he would do whatever it takes. This was in reference to getting voting uh, reform passed, even if it means changing Senate rules and getting rid of the filibuster. So let's talk about getting rid of the filibuster, because you've mentioned the two Democrats, uh, by whom you mean mm-hmm. Manchin and Cinema, of course, um, and there is discussion as we are recording this about getting rid of the filibuster and Manchin still saying, well, it has to have some Republican support. I don't know, would, would you know, one Republican vote do it? Uh, what will it take to get rid of the filibuster in order to protect voting rights and maybe many other things? We're now starting to see some serious pushback on uh, confirming judicial candidates, although President Biden mm-hmm. remains uh, actually ahead of pace to what Donald Trump did. But if there's now a huge pushback, it's going to be a problem. It's going to delay filling the empty spots that we need to have filled. So talk about filibuster. So uh, filibuster for I mean, that is a no brainer, but again, you can't do it unless you have 50. So, right. Like everybody, you know, we all agree on it, but if there's not 50, there is no, there's no game. I would say it, it strikes me that, uh, the thing is, I I actually, I I come at this a little bit different point of view, which is if you like there. Is there are things that can get, and we all know this because we know how Congress works. There are things that could get um, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema on board. Now, is it a bridge? Is it a school? Is it a this? Is it a that? Is it funding for this? Is it that? You know, but we know how Congress works. So there is no way that there isn't something that can get these two on board. And so I do think that Schumer needs to step up his game, right? Because if we, I mean, look, Nancy Pelosi, you love her or you hate her, that's fine. You don't talk, we don't find ourselves talking about the people who don't, you know, if Nancy could just get five extra votes, right? This is a failure on Schumer's part. So I would say we need him to really get going on making deals with these two people. And it, look, I, I don't like it. I mean, I want to know what kind of stocks and what kind of uh, coal money is uh, Joe Manchin making, but this is the hand you've been dealt, right? Mm-hmm. And if you can't play ball with that hand, then, you know, Democrats control the, uh, the White House, the Senate, and Congress, and not by huge margins, but by enough, so they should be able to do this. Um, look, it's dangerous. I would also say there's, you know— there's stuff like, for example, Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz wants this vote on the Nord Stream, this pipeline that will provide gas from Russia to Germany. Mm-hmm. Again, he's not wrong, right? It's bad. Russia is making money off Germany with oil and gas. This is bad, right? Russia's not, you know, it's not a democracy. It's a big meddler in our democracy. It's a really problematic Mm -hmm. country. We don't know, you know, there's, I mean, so in some ways, you know, there's stuff now where, where, uh, where Ted Cruz wants to want to vote on this and people don't want to do a vote on it. I mean, I just think that Democrats need to be savvy and they need to, they don't need to, you know, look, Republicans are not are are not interested in democracy anymore, and Democrats do need to protect democracy, but they also can make deals, and 
So they're not, you know, I think the the whole idea that they're sort of, they need to do this. They have to do this. The stakes are too high. I think in the same vein is getting major proposed legislation passed. One of the key pieces of pending legislation is the Build Back Better Act. Um, and there have been, I think, really interesting arguments about, one, the messaging around that, and then, two, the strategy that Democrats are using to get it passed in the Senate. So I guess maybe just to begin on that point, um, what is the problem with messaging around Build Back Better? Um, and what would you do to improve Democrats' messaging on that? So uh, originally the problem with Build Back Better was that they talked about the price tag and, the, who, and you know, the price tag was, you know, trillions of dollars. Now, <clears throat> of course, that was for 10 years. And the, tri- the price tag for the military budget is, you know, new, you know, is many multiples more of that than for one year. So uh, they approached it in the wrong way. Uh, but, you know, again, Democrats feel they're not they're sort of too good to be a salesman. And so when you're too good to be a salesman, you don't sell stuff. So uh, what and then it was like, what's in, what's out? It's not clear. I think they sort of were able to stop and say, like, this is in it. This is not in it. Um, uh, the child tax credit is a great example. That's a super popular thing. It goes away now. So we'll see if people miss it. I mean, that could come back if BBB passes. I always thought this weird end of the year BBB blow up was a little bit suspect in my mind because I thought there's no, um, there's no, uh, you know, Democrats have passed a lot of legislation, right? They passed a bailout, then they passed the hard infrastructure. So you know, there's no uh, there's no prize for passing legislation right before the end of the year when there's no midterm still. You know, it, it it makes sense for Democrats to try to pass this closer to the midterms just strategically. I'm not saying that's what they're doing because, you know, I, I would never accuse Democrats of being strategic. But <laughs> I'm just saying that, you know, ultimately it would make more sense to do it closer, a little closer to the summer. And again, with the January 6th stuff, it makes no sense to do that stuff so far out from the midterms if the American uh, attention span is so short. So again, I'm not saying they're doing this because I I have trouble imagining that they are, but uh, that does strike me. So let's... I mean, like you said, there was... I I, I was going to jump to her point about midterm elections and... um, it, I mean, they're 10 months away. Campaigning is going to start soon. It just does. And um, right. so what do you think are the biggest messaging points for both Republicans and Democrats for the midterms? What, what arguments would you make? Um, so I would. So I just want to like before I just want to to start on the midterms. There are some we're coming into these off year midterms and there's a lot of common uh mainstream media sentiment that Democrats are going to get a shellacking, Mm -hmm. right? That's sort of where we start. The mainstream media is like, this is it. They're going to get shellacked. They're going to lose the House. They might lose the Senate. Again, I don't know that that's true. I mean, maybe it is. You know, historically that's happened. But I think that it does a great disservice to frame them like that. I also think that uh, the common feeling was a year ago that Democrats were going to get creamed in redistricting. And right now, it looks like that's not happening. So it is, you know, if Democrats are not going to lose the House just by virtue of redistricting, I think Democrats need to take that and run with it. Like, that's pretty exciting stuff. And they have worked really hard. And Republicans have cheated really hard. So that is kind of amazing. Uh, What I think Democrats need to focus on is um, a couple things. One is they need to focus on the bailout. You know, we... Uh, we did what we could. They need, the number one thing Democrats need to do right now is keep schools open. I know that nobody wants to say that, but it's true because parents are really mad about school closings and it is making them crazy. And that's one of the reasons why Democrats have really lost in Virginia is that not, you know, people have jobs, they have lives, they are Uh, you know, this is the social order. Kids don't go to school. They get depressed. They fall behind. They have mental illness. I mean, these schools have got to stay open, like period. And we've also seen that they're not huge vectors of infection. So, 
And also we've seen that now we have vaccines and we have masking and we know how to prevent it and it's not hand sanitizer. And so like Democrats need to say we have done a better job of keeping life normal than Trump would have. And we, you know, we didn't do a perfect job because the virus mutated. We tried to get everyone vaccinated. We had a lot, right? We had the whole Fox News saying, don't take the vaccine, even though they had a vaccine. They themselves were all taking the vaccine or testing. But, you know, we had to fight against this very strong anti-vax uh, thread in this country. And so the virus did in the end mutate and come back. And it's been about two and a half years. I think uh, there's a lot of evidence to support the idea that this pandemic is almost over. We have medicine, you know, we're in the, that we may be entering the endemic stage. We have vaccines, we have medicine, we have treatment, we have, you know, we have a, a number of reasons to support the idea that we could be an endemic. But I do think, I think Democrats need to say we did the best we could. Uh, we kept your kids in school. We kept the airlines running. We kept the wheels going. We've now passed all this hard infrastructure, that bridge. We paid for that bridge that, you know, that we got that bridge built. We're getting you broadband. We're getting you glasses. We're expanding Medicare. You like your Obama. I mean, a great, the biggest failure of the Democratic Party in the last 15 years was when uh, Trump won and you saw people in the Republican Party saying, well, he might repeal Obamacare, but he won't get rid of ACA. <laughs> Just the same thing, yeah. right? People didn't know that their health care was Obamacare. Yeah. And so and that's a failure on Democratic messaging, right? Like, Dem, you know, your health care was given to you by Obamacare, by Obama, Obamacare. And Trump tried to take that away. And so. There's real failures on failure on Democrats, on, you know, and so it should be in the midterms. You want Medicare expansion. You want free hearing aids. You want free dental. You want free pre-K. We can do that for you. The other party is promising you what? Tax cuts for rich people, you know, more guns. I mean, it's not a choice. Right. Although I, one point I want to uh, ask you about when you're talking about keeping schools open for the first time, schools may be forced to close at least temporarily because of lack of staff who are homesick right. with Omicron. And it's happening in a lot of places. Um, now, it may not be a long term because it looks like Omicron has less severe uh, consequences, less hospitalization. Uh, although because right. of the number of people getting sick, hospitals are being overwhelmed. But at least for now, there are some schools that have to shut down. And that's the fault, actually, of the people who aren't vaccinated, because they're the ones who are going to the hospital. Right. And so somehow right. the Democrats need to figure out how to make it clear that the cause of this is not them. It's the Republicans who are not getting vaccinated. But um, I, right. I, just, I just thought I had to jump in with that. So... Um, what are some of the lessons Democrats should have taken from what happened in the special elections? Uh, you mentioned Virginia, but also, you know, New Jersey was uh, sort of up in the air and um, tighter than it should have been. And what can they learn in preparing for November? So I would say that in my mind, uh, New Jersey and Virginia are a little bit different. New Jersey, for sure, should not have been so close. And he and I think it may have been that he wasn't out there as much, as, you know, that there was a sense in which most people thought it was going to be a walk and a cakewalk. And so he they didn't do as much as they probably should have. And you saw other people lose. You know, there was a sort of expectation that this is a blue state. Uh, but he is a popular, you know, Murphy is a popular governor in in mm -hmm. in uh, New Jersey. He's not a, you know, it's not, he's not a Chris Christie. So I would say that that's, um, you know, I think that's a little bit different. I think what happened in Virginia was really a failure on the part. I mean, there were a number of things, but Youngkin was really smart about the way he played the Trump card, right? He didn't let Trump come up there. He didn't let him do a rally for him. He wore a kind of vest. You know, he's 
kind of a rich guy the way Trump is, but very careful not to be too crazy or say anything too crazy. Like he sort of knew that Virginia is a purple state. Um, I think historically, it's important to mention that Virginia tends to almost always go against the president. So that, you know, if you look back and, you know, there was a real sense in which Virginia was very likely going to go red either way. But I also think, I think Youngkin was good at what he did. And I think that uh, Terry seemed like he was panicked a little bit. The thing where he said that parents shouldn't have a, shouldn't control their kids' schooling. I mean, obviously teachers should, uh, teachers and administrators should um, create curriculum, but uh, telling parents that they don't have any place in their kid's school gets them enraged. Now, is it right? I don't know. I mean, I don't want somebody telling, I mean, I just think it's, it's like a problem that doesn't need to exist, right? And it really made an opening for Republicans to say, like, Democrats don't want you in their kids' schools. N- no, it's this is not how schools work, you know. So I think that he shouldn't have, you know, he was sort of, he, he sort of opened the door to that a little bit. And the panic in the schools is like a brilliant Republican plot to get things away from the fact that their legislation all sucks, right? So they're like, you know, we're going to save your, I mean, there's a, there's a, you know, there's another state now, um, Oklahoma, which has like a library bill now that wants to ban sexually explicit and LGBTQ literature from the library. I mean, like these people have never heard of the internet, right? So they're going to ban, <laughs> but, but, you know, ban books is like this amazing, you know, it's an, as you and I, and all mm-hmm. of us know, is a real tell that your, your, your country is in big trouble when people start banning books. That's never a good sign. Um, but also, more importantly, I think you have a sense in which the, these, you know, that these Republicans have sort of decided that they can sort of go into a culture war with the schools. And I think Democrats need to really stay away from that because uh, the it, Democrats lose in that. All right. So, um, so you mentioned a few issues that I think should be top on top of mind for everyone as we head into the midterm elections. I want to ask you about abortion because you've written extensively on the state of abortion law in America. Um, anyone who's followed the issue knows that the Supreme Court is chipping away at Roe very fast. Um, but abortion typically has been a motivating factor for Republicans in elections, but not so much for Democrats. Do you think that'll change in 2022? Um, perhaps if Roe ends up being overturned over the summer. Um, Will Democrats have a greater sense of urgency when it comes to this issue? You know, I think we tend not to do well when we uh, when we sort of think we can read people's minds. But uh, I know a lot of people are mad about Roe. I, I think, look, in the state of Texas, Roe has been overturned. You can't get an abortion. You have no, you know, if you're a woman who wants to get an abortion – in Texas, if you are more than six weeks pregnant, it's over. You can't get one. So uh, in that sense, the Roe gave women the right to constitutional right to have a um, have a reasonable time getting an abortion, right? That with the language is something effective that they had a reasonable expectation that they would be able to get that that was their right. Uh, so that's over in Texas. And um What's interesting about this Supreme Court, I think, and Jill, you can tell me if you think I'm crazy because you are a lawyer, (laughs) um, uh, is that they're not, they're so zealous that they tend not to try to keep up the appearance of bipartisanship or nonpartisanship. And you see it, uh, you see, like, the Roberts Court, where he was the swing voter, was very concerned with it making with making it look like they weren't doing extreme mm-hmm. things, even if they were. So you would see they would got something, but they would be really careful. Now you don't see that with the Supreme Court, right? Because the Texas law came up, and had they been had it been the Roberts Court, they would have said, you know, this is crazy. You can't have bounties. You can't have Republican governors creating bills that have bounties. That's crazy. We're going to knock this down. And we'll look at it again with uh, Jackson versus Dobbs versus Jackson, which is later on in the calendar, which is this Mississippi abortion law. But they didn't do that because they're so zealous that they couldn't 
knock down a law that's completely crazy. That means that really, I mean, if you let this stand, it means that Republican governors can do whatever they want, right? That's what it means. It means that the rights of the Constitution don't count in red states. And interestingly enough, I thought this was pretty cool on the part of Newsom was that Newsom then said, we're going to go after ghost guns and and make those, make that Supreme Court, uh, you know, say, you know, because if they, if they do, which we think they will overturn the blue state, but allow the red state, we're really seeing what a bunch of hacks they are and how partisan. So um, my guess is, so a lot of court watchers have said, and it's funny because when this, when uh, the Texas bill was about to be passed, I thought, this is going to happen. And and I talked to someone smart and they said, oh no, this will never happen. It's too insane. And uh, so I think it's very possible that they just knock down the statue, kick it back to the States. You have abortion deserts. You know, you you want an abortion in Oklahoma, you got to drive 200 miles or 300 miles. or So I could see a world where that happens. Um, I think that's a likely scenario. And and again, with the Supreme Court, they're the final word on everything. You, everything. you are not crazy. Um, you are actually <laughs> quite on target. <laughs> and, uh, you know, all I can think of is Sonia, Sonia Sotomayor's statement about will the Supreme Court survive this stench? And that's yeah. a very good question. Um, I, it, it's, it's awful. And, and, and so now we are, we're recording this podcast on January 4th, which is, of course, two days from the anniversary of the January 6th insurrection. And what do you think, viewing this from, you know, as far back as you can, how will history books remember the events of January 6th? Does that depend on whether we save our democracy or not? Or is this something that will go down in the history books no matter what happens? You know, it'll go down in the history books if it's the beginning of the end of American democracy, (laughs) right? I mean, look, what comes, all of this stuff is about what comes next. Uh, Certainly, when it happened, I thought this is a not, this is the end of the peaceful transfer of power. This is an enormous, enormous moment in in, uh, the American Republic, and it's really bad. Um, Republicans and conservatives have tried really hard to just pretend it didn't happen. Um, I, you know, I don't know where this goes next. Look, there are needs. I think a lot of what happens is going to rely on Democrats being really focused and on some more Republicans saying that they have to do something that they can't let this continue. And I don't know that that happens. I mean, I, it's hard for me to imagine a world where things get better. Um, but I hope that, I hope that that's what happens. I hope that it doesn't, that this, we just don't keep coming on this path. And it's funny because right after January 6th, there was a moment where Republicans thought like, this is too much. Like we can't do this. This is a bridge too far. And Mm -hmm. then um, they changed their mind. You know, when McCarthy went down to Mar-a-Lago to start using Trump to fundraise again, that was sort of the line in the sand. And there's a scary thought of Trump coming back, but there's an even scarier thought of uh, Josh Hawley, you know, who tried to get the insurrection going, or a Ted Cruz, or... um, or, uh, uh, you know, another really bad faith actor who's a little bit smarter, who could really get in there and mess stuff up. So I'm worried and I don't know what it will look like. I hope that it will look like a sort of moment when America gets its, um, gets its, uh, sense back, but I'm worried that it won't. Well, I, I remain Pollyanna and am optimistic that we will get it right, that Democrats will get more active. Uh, I, let's look at what the media is doing and whether there's something special they can do in covering the events of January 6th and using, uh, I have a hashtag on Twitter called Say This, Not That, which is, you know, 
Call it an insurrection, not a riot or a protest. Call it lies, right. not misinformation. And so what can the media do in covering this? And uh, is there a way to make this the 9-11 bring us all together kind of thing where we stop talking about, as you mentioned, civil war and start coming together to save our democracy, our way of life? I mean, so the most important thing when you're covering Trump is that you do this truth sandwich, which Margaret Sullivan has written a lot about and a lot of media columnists have written about, which is you uh, you make sure that you ta- you say, like, Trump didn't win the election, and then you put the little Trump lie in the middle, and then at the end, and then around it you say, the, you know, was one of the most secure elections ever, right? That, in fact, this one from the Trump administration said it was, you know, you yeah. put that lie, you, you, you put the lie in context with where it is in, in, the, in the lie. The problem, again, is not, the mainstream media is guilty of some two sides thing, and certainly there was, mm-hmm. you know, a, you know, will Steve Bannon have his <laughs> say, right? No, he doesn't get his say. I mean, this is, this is history. It's not your opinion. Um, mainstream media has gotten a little better, though, about not just reporting Trump's lies in a way that they can be uh, used as as to sort of as Trump propagating a lie. I would say the thing that I'm the more more worried about is uh, this kind of um, the the far right media that doesn't mm-hmm. have any truthfulness and even. Like, a, you know, the, the Fox News opinion hosts. I mean, those guys can say whatever they want, right? They're not going to say, you know, they're going to say things like, um, you know, Democratic crybabies who overlay, you know, they're going to make fun of the Democratic fear of, and they're already doing it on the Internet, so you know what's happening. Uh, they're going to make fun of the Democratic fear of authoritarianism, they're going to say it's hilarious, right? That what authoritarianism is great. You guys are crazy. And it's meant to be a joke, but it's meant to be a joke that's, that sort right. of sows the soil, right? That Democrats are hysterical and that Republicans are never going to do anything like that. And you should just give them all your power anyway. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm worried about it. I think it's probably... Well, it is up to the press to communicate the facts, but someone has to be yeah. on the other side listening. And... So for those of us who listen to MSNBC, we're hearing the facts and we get it. But for the people who watch only Fox, they're hearing a completely alternate universe of information, and they believe that too. And we're going to have to get past that. Um, I, I don't know. Victor, what do you think? I agree. I think in addition to the press, um, one way that the public can understand the severity of the facts of January 6th and the threat to democracy is through January 6th and the House Committee investigation, which I guess makes me want to ask you, Molly, what do you think of the work that has done so far? Um, And can you tell us about anything about what it might be, about what it might have planned for the future? Um, Maybe talk to our audience about that. Um, So I think they've done a pretty good job. I actually thought that Liz Cheney reading those texts from Don Jr. and from that those were pretty that was pretty smart, and the texts from uh, the different you know members of the family and and people around him and the Fox News hosts I thought that was pretty smart and and it it pointed out something which I think was important which was these people knew it was bad. And you saw them later on, like Laura Ingram saying, like, ha, 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 Democrats are hysterical. And Sean Hannity, they were, you know, wasn't such a big deal. But they knew it was bad at the time. They knew it was really, really bad. So that shows a certain important um, important thought process, which I think is really needs to be understood. Um, so, and and look, Mash Gasson, who is one of the smartest writers out there and who covered the Soviet Union talks about this idea of that narrative is really the way to fight fascism. So if that is true, and I think it is, then you want to have televised hearings to beat the band as much as possible, have everyone show up who will show up, and the people who won't show up can 
they can have the empty seat. You know, some of this is theatrics and that's okay. You know, we need theatrics. I mean, again, it's this idea that Democrats think they're too good for the things that are keeping Republicans in power or getting them in power. And and I think that's really a wrong instinct. So I hope they do have huge hearings. I hope they're televised. I hope they're long. I hope they, you yeah. know, get people out there and read transcripts. And I mean, really, you know, and I think, and I hope that people go to jail. And I hope, I mean, I'm less worried about the January 6th committee than I am about Merrick Garland. Because I see, I know, I know they have something planned. Whereas Merrick Garland... I hope that Jill is right. Um, but he worries me more just because he's kind of an institutionalist the way that Roberts is an institutionalist. And I would, he'd be great on the Supreme Court. I'm a little worried about him in this uncharted territory. I mean, I think you said something so correct uh, a couple of minutes ago, which is how we remember January 6th really depends on what comes next. And that comes from Merrick Garland, the January 6th committee, the media. Um, but Let's maybe end on something that proves um, an especially big problem for our entire country, which is the unvaccinated. And, um, you know, I read an article, you were patient 1133 in one of the first okay. vaccine trials. Um, tell us what made you want to become a test subject and what made or what was that experience like for you? So I, um, I wanted to do it because I felt like it was... Um, I, I believe in science, you know, and I wanted to um, put my body where my mouth was, you know, and I felt like it was safe. And I knew these mRNA vaccines would be, uh, people would be freaked out by them because they were a new kind of technology. But I knew they had been around for a while because they had they had made them, you know, a it, what in 2007 to deal with SARS. So I felt pretty comfortable, but I'm a huge hypochondriac. So I wasn't, I was nervous about it. Um, I, I don't know. It was my chance to get to do something. And, you know, it was, I have been very lucky in my life, very privileged. And I felt that this was an opportunity. And I also thought that if I did it and I didn't die, which of course I didn't, that I would be able to sell it to people. Like I would be able to help them get vaccinated and show that it was safe. And and that was something I wanted to do. And, you know, these drug trials are not, they're not like media organizations. You know, it's not like a movie premiere where they go to influencers. You know, you have to kind of get yourself into them. And so not that I'm an influencer, but you know what I mean? Like I, I had to go in and, and uh, get into a trial and, and you can't, you know, so I filled out all the forms and I went here and I went there. Luckily, they needed thousands and thousands of people for these trials. But, um, you know, I had to sort of make a case. And uh, I was glad that I did it. And I felt that it was a profound um, privilege to get to do it in the end and to get to be a part of history. And um, I was I was glad I did it. Yeah, in that New York Times article, you wrote, um, it's not hard to see where this is heading, a nightmare in which we have a vaccine yet mistrust of the government is so great that the people won't take it. That proved so true. Do you think there's any hope of reaching the unvaccinated at this point? You know, it's an interesting thing because uh, what happened was that Republicans, there was a sort of unvax, there was a sort of anti-vax vein in our culture and Republicans sort of got into it because they thought it might hurt Biden or because they thought it was some way of striking out against government or what. I don't even know what it was, but it was some kind of nutty uh, f fiasco that was sort of uh, organized. I I don't know. I mean, I don't know. At this point, 800,000 Americans, more than 800,000 Americans have died of COVID. So I don't know if you can live in a house where you have, you know, where you're where a member of your family dies of COVID and still refuse to get the vaccine. I don't know what else could um, what else there is that could convince someone. Well, we thank you for what you did to not only prove the vaccine safe, but for all of your writing that helps to keep us informed. Um, one 
that we haven't mentioned in terms of your writing is you have an Atlantic newsletter. And mm-hmm. so I'd like you to mention that now so that our audience can sign up and read and follow your work through that. Um, it's called Wait What? And it's on the Atlantic news. It's on the Atlantic site. You can find it. It's called Wait What? And it's a, a newsletter and it comes out once a week. And it's about this kind of thing, you know, about how uh, we are so... You know, just, I mean, I have one this week about Marjorie Taylor Greene. And um, so, yeah, so definitely subscribe. It is a really good way to keep in in touch with what I'm doing. Well, I can't wait to read about Marjorie Taylor Greene because I'm sure it will be sharp-witted and um, interesting. And we thank you for being with us today. And we look forward to following you in the future. Thank you so much, Molly John Fast. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed this episode with Molly Jong Fast. Thank you so much for listening or watching on YouTube. We hope that you'll tune in next week for another episode of iGen Politics, wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube, and leave us a five-star review and rating on Apple Podcasts. Thanks so much.